Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Feel Younger and Genetic Insights, Elwin Robinson. And today we are discussing, you know, all those different health myths you hear and how to discuss it and how to talk about it. So tell me, Elwin, why did you feel it was important to bring this topic to our listeners today? Yeah, um, and you know, it's definitely not all. So if there are ones that we don't cover that you'd like to hear an explanation of, uh, make sure to add it to the comments underneath on YouTube and we'll probably do a future episode on it. So I thought this is important because, you know, in some cases, hopefully you're going to hear something that like a myth that you had and you're going to have an alternative perspective on it to consider, which is good. But I suspect that a lot of our viewers and listeners will already be aware that a lot of these are myths. So the idea I thought is to show you how to explain to people, and I'm going to do my absolute best to show you how to do it in a succinct and concise way, how to address these things that you commonly hear from people. I know we have a lot of people watching, listening, who are you know doctors, practitioners, um, just people trying to help people in general, family, friends, whatever it might be. And so these myths often are the things that get in the way. Uh, myths is a big one. I would say that false beliefs about things, in my opinion, is probably the biggest things that hold us back as a species. So yeah, from being healthy, but you know, from being happy, from being successful, from exploring the stars to making the most of our own planet and you know, everything like false beliefs about things are so incredibly damaging because every time you are operating from a false premise, it doesn't matter how hard you work or how good your attitude is or how good the teamwork is between you and other people and all the rest of it. Like if you're moving in the wrong direction because you're basing what you're doing on a false premise, then um, if you actually get a good result, it's going to be just through sheer luck because usually, you know, it's the other way around. So to me, I consider that part of our job here. And I'm not obviously claiming to know everything and who knows, maybe in years in the future, I'm going to realize <laughs> some of the things I've said are false premises, but that's okay. I want to, you know, do the best I can to um, help to get rid of these false beliefs, these false ideas to, you know, help empower you to, you know, be successful. And of course, we focus here on health and rejuvenating to, uh, to have all of the vitality of youth while retaining the wisdom of experience. Um, and so, yeah, I want to give short, ideally, uh, little guides about how to address this. And even in your own mind, you know, sometimes we have thoughts coming up, like we have conflicts in our own head about, oh, this this is good. Oh, no, it's not. You know, so like how to address these things. And I uh, hope it's helpful. Wonderful. I mean, yeah, the, and as well, I mean, maybe this would come, this will come up as we discuss, discuss these things today. But there's also, and maybe this is a future episode, a lot of the conflicting health, um, how can I say, recommendations that are out there saying this is good no it's bad and then you know being able to discuss that at length as well on another episode potentially um so let's go ahead and kick it off with the first myth that we're discussing today which is this gene i've heard about is super important yeah i slipped this in uh at the beginning uh because i get this a lot not really in the comments but through emails and of course it's not positioned that way what the email i usually get is does your company test for this specific gene because and you know they don't say this, but this is what I infer. Um, I have learned, I have heard that it is extremely important for, and, and therefore I want to make sure that you cover it because this is the one I'm interested in. And I, I kind of give the same answer every time, which is usually, uh, yes, we do, <laughs> first of all, because we have you know, extremely broad and comprehensive uh, 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 testing and evaluation. But I want to disabuse you of the illusion that like this gene is all important. Uh, we were discussing this beforehand, Chrissy. Uh, there are some cases where just one gene or just one SNP, and a SNP being a variation in a gene, that you know we discussed that in detail in a previous episode that we did on genetics, uh, that just one variation of gene or even just one gene is all important for a specific thing. One of the places I do see that for, for instance, commonly is with nutrient needs. Um, so we've done episodes on that before. Some people need a lot more certain nutrients than others. And yeah, often that is just one gene because you know it might be one gene that is helping your body to create that nutrient or it's breaking it down more quickly or whatever. And so, you know, in that case, one gene can be all important. But when I get people asking, 
about one gene because they're interested in something like, I don't know, heart health, for instance, cardiovascular health. It's like, I've been told that this one is the crucial one. Uh, even something else, what did I see the other day? Like, um, like a food allergy or, or something, I think. And I had to say, I have to say every time, there are the, the people who tell you that one gene is all important. Generally, the reason they're doing it is either ignorance or it is, and I think this is more common, it's marketing. So there's not many people, there's not many companies who can do what we do at Genetic Insights. I know this is like a product plug, and I don't think any of our other ones here are product plugs. But um, And again, we're not the only ones. There are other companies that do what we do that... Um, do a thorough analysis. But just to explain, if I wanted to set up a genetic company that is like most of them out there, and uh, um, unfortunately is like all the ones that are super popular, and I don't even just mean with, you know, I don't know normal people like you or I, Chrissy. I'm actually talking about a lot of the time with doctors. When I talk with doctors, um, they say, oh yeah, I'm already using this service. And when I look it up, it's one that only evaluates like a handful of uh, uh, SNPs very often, which are these variations in the genes. When I say handful, sometimes it's three or four, sometimes it's a dozen, sometimes it's 50, but it's really not very much. Um, and they come to all kinds of conclusions, these other systems, based on very little data. And the reason why they do that is because anyone can set up a company doing that, basically. What all you do is you get a raw DNA file, which is just this huge list of uh, SNPs, basically, and um, you can you can write a piece of software, pay someone to write a piece of software saying, if you see this line of code, if you see this SNP, then give this interpretation, right? Because it's very simple. This means this. If you see this specific thing, then this. Um, the problem with that is that it's, you know so inaccurate, or it can be so inaccurate that it's bordering on irresponsible. So for instance, you know, just because you have a specific, so it's, it's true that a specific SNP, a specific variation of the genes can give you an increased risk for heart disease. And so this is why they get away with it. It's not technically accurate. Yes, the research has shown that this SNP can, you know, is correlated with increased heart disease or, or whatever. I'm just picking on heart disease here. But the problem is, you may also have free SNPs that show a decreased risk of heart disease. And they're not looking at that. They're not evaluating all of the ones that are relevant, weighing them like, okay, this has this level of importance, this has this level of importance, weighing them up against each other and then coming to an overall conclusion. The software to do that cannot just be written by anyone, by any developer. And that's why, you know, what we do, again, we're not the only ones, but Genetic Insights, it's like a full on, um, AI program which uh, was created and is maintained on an ongoing basis by several dozen full-time AI engineers and then it's also uh, maintained and updated by several dozen full-time research scientists because that's what's required to actually make that you know as accurate as possible given the research available. As I said the majority of companies don't do that so if you don't have that capacity like we do and a few other companies like us do what do you do? Well, the only way you can sell the benefit of what you're doing is you can say, this SNP is really important, or this gene is really important. This is you know, super important. And based on this, you can make all kinds of decisions about your health, and you can know your risks, and you can know which supplements to take and all the rest of it. And so that's why I say I think a lot of the time it's due more to marketing than really not knowing. And, and the other thing is, if you've never heard of any of this kind of stuff before, it's, pr it's still pretty cool. All this science is pretty new, right? Um, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, none of this stuff was available at all. So when you suddenly hear, um, not, to the public anyway, so when you suddenly hear, oh, you know, just based on this thing in your genes, which is easy to check, uh, we can tell you that you need more of this B vitamin or something like that. Oh, wow, that's like really awesome. Um, but so compared to what we had before, which is nothing, what a lot of these companies do is pretty cool. But it's pretty cool, I say it that way rather than it's really great because the problem is, as I said, it can be so inaccurate, it's actually misleading. It's actually telling you you have an increased risk for something or you, you, know, you have a decreased risk for something and there's all kinds of reasons why that's not actually the case. So uh, again, feel free to keep emailing me these questions and I'll, I'll tell you in each individual case. Um, but usually the answer is yes, we cover it, but 
you know, we've kind of added the genes more recently because people keep asking for them because of all this misinformation out there. But the truth is, you know, like, do you actually care about the gene or do you care about whatever issue it is that you've got or that you're worried that you might get? And, the bigger picture. Yeah. And that's really, you know, the thing that I would recommend to focus on. And when we're talking about root issues, you know, as we talk about the Rejuvenate Blueprint, um, you know, it's nutrients, that's toxins, that's hormones, that's neurotransmitters, that's chronic infections, that's lifestyle factors. So, you know, yeah, you, you may not care about a specific hormone on its own, for its own sake or a specific nutrient for its own sake, but it is useful to get the genetic reports on that that tells you if they are you know innately out of balance if you're born with them being out of balance but uh, individual genes while they can be cool and interesting and sometimes helpful uh, i would strongly encourage people not to believe the hype that in most cases anyway that any one gene is going to make a big difference it may do as again with something like nutrient needs but it's definitely not going to one gene is not going to make all the difference when it comes to whether you're going to get heart disease or diabetes or anything like that Beautifully said. And as you've discussed in the past about when you were discovering um, about the lead toxicity that you had and how it was about your body clearing it, it was a wider picture that you needed to look into your genes to figure out what that was. It wasn't just down to this one thing. Um, so yeah, there's a bigger, whole, whole, bigger, wider picture for everybody to look at than just such a microscopic view on one particular thing. Brilliant. Um, another one that I've just thought of uh, as we were just discussing this is that if my grandfather has it, my gran my mother has it, I'm going to get it. So, you know, and again, speaking on genes. Yeah, it's a good one. And, you know, as someone who had a mother who had, um, uh, you know, cancer four times and tumors more times than that and ended up dying of it, um, it's very easy for me to think, oh, well, that's what's going to happen to me too, or there's a high chance of happening. And especially, as you said, if it's not just one, if it's not just a parent, but if it's also then, you know, a grandparent and, and, and brothers and sisters and all the rest of it and uncles, it's, it, it starts stacking up more and more like this is inevitable. Um, so I guess it comes down to, to, to address that myth, we have to look at, you know, what percentage of the risk of getting all of these serious diseases that potentially can end your life what percentage of it is down to genetics? What percentage is, is it something that you're born with that you can't change? And what percentage um, is it down to lifestyle, environment, and all the things that you can change? And so obviously this is uh, on a case-by-case -case basis to some degree, but I've done so many interviews on this now with another podcast, and uh, you know, I was often asked, well, you know, what is it roughly? And so I ended up like come, actually giving a, an actual precise answer. And so I would say, you know, the, the amount that is based on genetics, again, not just one gene, but <laughs> all the genes, um, is about 40%. Something else, I was just being interviewed last night by someone else, uh, a doctor with 25 years experience. And uh, he said, you know, that's funny that you say that because I haven't had your experience of looking at genetics, but just through my clinical experience, I came to the conclusion it was about 33%, is what he said. Um, and I said, you know, you may be right. I mean, 40% is an estimate, but it's something like that. So meaning, um, yeah, it's not nothing, right? And so if you're the kind of person who I used to be, who was like, oh, you know, I'm not influenced by the past. I create my own destiny. I create my own reality, all that kind of stuff. It can be disheartening to hear that that also is a myth that <laughs> you're completely free of your past uh like uh, and your and your innate programming i guess your genetic programming it does make a difference um but it is not the be all and end all of everything so for instance i'll give you an example my heart health report uh i actually have like a one one percentile risk so meaning you know in a room full of 100 people i'm the least likely to have serious cardiovascular disease um now, does that mean I can say, hey, I'm not going to bother checking my blood pressure, I'm not going to bother checking my, you know, LDL or a lipoprotein or tr triglycerides or whatever, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to give up on exercise, I'm going to whatever, because, you know, that's great. Well, no, because, you know, as it says in that very same report, it, it, it is about a 40% chance, sorry, it is about a 40% weighting is given to genetics in that case. So meaning 60% is still lifestyle and environment meaning I can easily override those good genetics with bad lifestyle choices and still end up with heart disease or early heart disease. 
It just means that all other factors being equal. So if I am next to someone who is the other end, who's the 99th percentile, and we both have the same or similar lifestyle and environment, it would be shocking if it didn't happen to them first. Like, <laughs> that's what it means. But the lifestyle and environment, uh, you know, still makes a big difference. It makes the majority of difference in most cases. Um, so it's absolutely not inevitable just because, you know, as you said, your father, your grandfather, your uncle, and all these people had heart disease or something else doesn't mean that you're definitely going to get it. But it may mean, and this is where it's good to do the genetic testing, that it's more likely to happen to you. And notice I use the word may, because yes, obviously a lot of the time when I'm looking at people's genetics and I say, oh, look, you've got increased risk for this. And they'll say, yeah, my parent had that or my grandparent had that or whatever. But it does also happen. It's not that rare that they say, oh, well, I'm interested in this because you know various relatives had it. And I, looked at, I look at the genes and it says, nope, no elevated risk at all. And so that does happen. And so just that's the other thing just because all these relatives had it, you might not have, have it. Like it may not have passed on to you. And this is where it's really good to get the facts rather than, um, you know, speculation to see because not only does lifestyle usually make a big difference than genetics, you might not even have the genetics either. So it's always good to find out. Fantastic. Yes. Um, good to know that your environment does create and have a big impact on the outcome for sure. And that's why, so just to add to that, uh, the majority of most of our reports are recommendations, not the risk score. You know, the risk score is a few pages with some science behind it, but, uh, you know, the recommendations is most of it because, um, you know, you absolutely can do something about these things. And that's what's good about the recommendations as well is that they're presented in order which is relevant to, you know, your specific genetics. Wonderful. And if you haven't checked them out, we do have an episode going over the genetic reports. So that might be a good one to look into if you're curious and you haven't quite gone down that route yet. Perfect. The next one that I have is if I just stick to this diet, everything will be resolved. <laughs> this is definitely the biggest myth I see in the alternative or natural health or whatever you want to call it world. So the way I see it is that there's mainstream medicine, right? And in mainstream medicine, with some exceptions, like heart health and diabetes, but even then it's it's not great, but with some exceptions, usually a doctor will not acknowledge any difference the health makes with your issue. So, you know, whether it's like a eczema or whether it's, um, you know, cancer or whether it's whatever, like uh, kidney disease, they'll be like diet either, you know, it barely makes a difference, it only makes a difference in very specific cases or very commonly it makes no difference. And so because of that, because of that general attitude of doctors, and also, by the way, doctors um, very rarely, I mean, I've met some, but very rarely focus on diet themselves either for, for their own well-being, right? And so they, so that's the mainstream perspective. And then people are like sick of hearing that. They start seeing information that debunks that, oh, that's a myth, which is true. But then they immediately usually fall into the net, <laughs> the uh, trap of the kind of what I call mainstream alternative health gurus who are pushing a myth which is very compelling to the human mind. I think actually it's much easier to swallow than the truly mainstream doctor myth. And it's this myth of if you just eat the right diet, everything will be good, all your health problems will be resolved. Now, is it entirely a myth? No, because it is true that with some people, the only thing stopping them being fully healthy is just that they eat so badly or that they eat in a way that's so wrong for them. And so that's why all these people who push these myths, they do have a bunch of you know, followers, audience, whatever, who say, this is great, it totally works. You know, whether the system is uh, fruitarian or whether it is vegan or whether it is carnivore, or whether it is keto, or whether it is paleo, or whether it is Atkins or whatever it might be, there'd be a load of people saying it worked for me and all my health problems went away because in some cases that is all that's necessary, you know, and it is case by case. And a lot of people, if you've done one of the ones that I've just listed, you've probably done like at least five. That's the way it usually works. A lot of people try a lot of different diets. Um... And obviously, you know, it's not always black and white, like, 
you might have some benefits with one and but then you try the, the other because this still isn't resolved and then you get some benefits but then the other problems come back and you know it's not always simple because there is usually more to health than diet um so if you have you know quote unquote strong genetics not there's really any such thing but some people do you know, have been dealt a more challenging hand than others it's true so if you have a less challenging genetic hand and overall your lifestyle and environment have been pretty good despite whatever it is that you, you know you are or where you did wrong and then you just clean up your diet and that may look different for different people it's possible that whatever led you you know your low energy your skin problems your headaches whatever will go away and you'll be like oh that's it the problem is that then other people like me and many 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 people i speak to see that they see the health guru with such a high level of certainty and why are they so certain well partly because of the you know cognitive bias they're getting all this feedback from people it is working for partly maybe because they have narcissistic tendencies in many cases as we've talked about uh in previous episodes and so they're so certain that they, all you gotta do is this diet and then you know, I, I knew someone who who worked for one of these gurus, um, very close in their inner circle, and they had such severe health issues, and they'd had them for such a long time, and they weren't going away. And when I questioned them about, you know, is this diet actually working for you? They said, um, oh, yeah, this is, we're just not sticking to 100%. And it was an extremely strict, extreme diet, which would be extremely difficult, and I would say actually damaging to stick to 100%. Like the reason, oh, I don't want to give too much information away, I don't want anyone to guess who I'm talking about, but uh, often with these extreme diets, the reason why most people don't stick to them is because they are missing some fundamental nutrient like fat or carbohydrate or you know vitamin, whatever. And so sooner or later, the person kind of like can't handle it anymore. Um, but the and, and they start eating this thing almost involuntarily and then afterwards like oh what did i do i broke my you know whatever it might be and and then they punish themselves and they blame themselves and and of you know the, the guru kind of says well it's your own fault you, you're not sticking to it 100 percent and the people in the guru circle on the facebook group or whatever say it's your own fault you didn't stick to it 100 percent and then um you know people can be stuck in that trap for years and years and years so i've seen it happen to people i care about I was in that trap, I would say, kind of, though I was always a bit skeptical, but definitely more than I would like to admit, I was in that trap. Um, and so it's like really, really um, important to realize, yeah, it may help some people, but usually there's a lot more to it. And again, that's why I created the Rejuvenate Blueprint, to talk about like the seven root causes of chronic disease. And, um, you know, of those, there's nutrition and there's toxicity as number two and number three. And it's true. If you get the right nutrients for you, that can help you feel better. So again, that's why it works sometimes. And it's true, if you remove things that, that are toxins or that your body treats as toxins, like allergies and tolerances, then that can make all the difference and that can make you feel better. So that's why these systems, you know, these diets sometimes, maybe often do work, uh, but there is absolutely more to it in many cases. Maybe it's some toxin that's not food related. Maybe it's some chronic systemic infection that's not food related. So maybe it's some kind of hormone or neurotransmitter imbalance. And that di a diet, no matter any diet, doesn't address or it certainly doesn't resolve those things. And so it's very important to um, question. If, if you find it extremely difficult to stick to a diet, it's probably not actually the right diet. That's another thing that I'll just add. Um, something that is genuinely satiating you even if it's, you know, the flavors are not initially appealing to you or whatever, like once you have been doing it for a few weeks, if you are still not enjoying it, if you're still not loving it, if you're still like, oh God, I've got to eat this, um, or oh God, I really miss this, I would say that that's not a sign of your lack of willpower. That's a sign that this diet isn't really doing it for you. So anyway, hopefully I'll put out my diet book by the end of the year. It will not be eat this because I said so, <laughs> or eat this because I do even worse. Um, because I, as I, you know, I've said before, and I'll say it again, I have not found anything that is universally healthy and good for everyone. I think we talked about this before, Chrissy, and I asked you if you could think of an exception, you came up with a good one, which was purifying water. And I agree with that. I think 
purifying air, that's probably universally beneficial. Purifying water, that's probably universally beneficial. But there's certainly no food Precisely. that's universally good. You know, going and getting fresh air isn't good for everyone because it's got pollen in it, which, you know, uh, like exercise is not good for everyone. There's no type of exercise. Like there's always something. Sunlight is not good for everyone. All the, like <laughs> all the cliches, there's like almost nothing that is universally good for everyone. And certainly in the case of food, there's, there really is nothing that is universally good for everyone. And so it's finding what's right for you. So any one size fits all diet, please don't fall for it. If it happens to work for you, and resolve all your health issues. Well, you're probably not watching this, but um, <laughs> but if you are, that's great, good for you, but don't assume it's gonna work for everyone else or even anyone else necessarily. Genetic Insights provides cutting edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours, you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your genetic insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. Well, since we were just talking about diet, the next one I have here is organic doesn't matter. Hmm. Yeah, so in the same way that the whole, I said earlier that it's, it, it's convenient if you have a genetics company that can't do what we do and it can only kind of look at one snip at a time, it's very convenient to magnify the importance of that snip or that gene. So it's also very convenient, and I have a lot more sympathy for this, um, if you have limited resources or if you feel like you have limited resources and organic is very expensive or it's difficult to get to kind of convince yourself that organic isn't real and that it doesn't matter or that it's you know not important enough to focus on and and i have some sympathy for this perspective um because i don't also believe it is the most important things in thing in the world and also i take it on a case-by-case -case basis so to me the pesticides and herbicides that they use in non-organic food whether it's plants or animals are you know universally toxic and poisonous however just like all the other toxins that we talk about um, some people have more of an issue with them than others so again this is why i would defer to genetics i sometimes see people who have you know, pesticide sensitivity uh, sometimes also we have organic phosphate, uh, organic phosphate sensitivity reports. When I see those, I always say to people, look, you really want to try and be strict with this because for whatever reason, your body has more of an issue of detoxifying these things, even than average. Everyone has an issue of it. I'm not denying that, but some people have an issue of it more than others. So certainly in that case, it's something that you want to be strict about. Um, so why does organic make a difference? Why does it actually matter? Uh, so there's a couple of things, right? So first of all, there's the obvious thing that I just covered, which is if it's organic, it should have less and also less poisonous versions of those things, of pesticides and herbicides in the case of plants 
and then also you know antibiotics and hormones and other stuff in the case of animals it should have less of that i say should because there's a lot of just in the way that like recycling garbage there's like some skepticism that it just ends up in the same <laughs> landfill uh there's a lot of kind of talk that especially if you're buying it from like a supermarket or something like that that um you're going to end up with something that's basically uh you know slightly less <laughs> drenched in pesticides but not actually much less that often there are still some that are allowed there are still some uh you know chemicals that are allowed in animal raising as well and so um so you know that is an issue and the other issue is if you're buying from a local farm that you know and trust and you know what they do but they do not have an organic certification you may actually be in a better position because it's expensive and difficult to get an organic certification um, and so also you can kind of make a judgment call in that regard if you trust the farmer that you're dealing with i mean for instance recently as you know because i've been eating um new zealand beef um and it's not certified organic but uh it's like 100 percent grass fed over there um they they generally use a lot less anyway and um there just is so much less toxicity in the environment over in new zealand than there is in most of the uh, northern hemisphere so just the ambient poison toxicity even irrespective of what they may be spraying on the crops and in fact you know with new zealand beef my understanding is they pretty much don't eat crops because it's a more temperate environment than even most you know a temperate country like the uk um it's cheaper to feed them grass year round than it is to like buy them feed in winter or whatever it might be and so um and grass really doesn't need a huge amount of pesticides to <laughs> keep it growing so that a cow can eat it so it is kind of case by case um what i would definitely recommend in general despite what i just said is focus more on uh, animal foods when it comes to organic because animals tend to, to concentrate um, so they eat a lot of plants to end up with whatever meat or uh, dairy uh, or eggs that you end up with and so you know, with eggs, for instance, I would make sure to always organic because chickens are going to be given feed. So you want to make sure it's organic feed, for instance. Yeah, so then it's not gen genetically modified either, correct? Uh, yes, that's another reason. Definitely, if it is a plant that is frequently genetically modified, like soy or corn or papaya, believe it or not, or uh, rice or various things like that, then it's very good to make sure that it's organic as well. For that reason, that's a good point, Chrissy. And then the other thing with um, organic, which I think is less focused on, but also really important, is the food that the plants get, or in fact, the food that the plants get that the animals then eat. Um, so as we've talked about before, it only takes three minerals, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, to make plants grow big. Not strong and healthy, but they deal with that with the pesticides and the herbicides, but to make them grow big and quickly, you only need three minerals. Um, and so if you're using uh, inorganic, chemical fertilizers then that plant food is going to be deficient on every mineral other than phosphorus and potassium uh, like zinc and magnesium and all that good stuff that you probably hear about a lot so that's another big reason to eat organic so if you're on a budget i would suggest at least avoiding like was it the dirty dozen or something you can find lists online on which plants foods have the the highest amount of pesticides but remember that is not all there is to it um, I wouldn't be as strict with organic though, because as we said, like getting it from a local farmer who can't afford an organic certification may, and of course this is case by case, but may actually be getting it better than getting it from a super mainstream supermarket, which claims to be organic, but within that certification, a lot is still allowed anyway. So um, I kind of agree that organic isn't the be all and end all, but I definitely disagree that it is not a real thing and that it shouldn't be paid attention to. Bottom line is what should be paid attention to is how much poison has this food got added to it um, and how much nutrients has this food got added to it. It's back to steps two and three of the rejuvenate blueprint. And unfortunately, as I said, that's not as simple as just going for organic rather than not. But it's true also, if you're someone who has more money than time, maybe because you're very busy with working, that using the shorthand of I can't get into learning all that stuff you just said, Owen, I'll just make sure I always buy organic. If you do that, you're going to definitely be in a better position. Very good. Very good. Beautiful, Owen, rightly said. Um, so the next one that I'm going to go into is fasting or intermittent fasting is all you need to resolve health issues. 
I see this one surprisingly often, and I hear it surprisingly often from clients, even sometimes practitioners. Again, I was just uh, addressing it with uh, you know someone's podcast the other day. So this one is very, very compelling. Um, because yeah, because the, there's a lot out there right now, especially just do this fasting, just do this, and it's going to take you, it's going to you know turn on autophagy, it's going to kill the senescent cells, it's going to do all of this, and you're going to lose weight. It just sounds like it's the cure-all <laughs> for everything. <laughs> yeah. So there are some, there are some, maybe if someone really wants to push me, I could even admit to many benefits of fasting. Um, and so... And I think there are cases, and oh God, I was interviewed about this recently. I was like, I wish I'd have said this so I get an opportunity to say it now. Um, there are many cases where it is beneficial. And I do think there are there is a certain specific set of criteria under which fasting is beneficial. So make sure I don't forget to explain that, Chrissy, because I'm about to say a bunch of things as to why I don't think it's the be all and end all. But I will say when I think it can be a good idea. Okay, so why is it not the be all and end all? It has some benefits. What benefits? We just talked about with every piece of food you eat, it's this minefield of it may contain all kinds of poisons, right? And so it is true if you stop eating or eat less or even just eat less often, you are giving your body a break from that poison. So that is absolutely true. All the poison which comes with the food. Um, you're also giving your body a break from having to digest food, which is one of the big, obviously, claims of fasting. And it's true that when you do that, your body goes into a kind of you know, clean up thing. It starts recycling cells. Um, it starts to liberate toxins from storage in the process of breaking down, say, you know, fat or even, you know, muscle or whatever. Like there's uh, toxins bound up in those things, especially in fat. And so in the process of breaking down those things because your body is running out of nutrition so therefore it has to break down your existing tissues to find energy and nutrients in order to function it's true while it breaks those down to function some toxins will also be broken released into the system which then in an ideal world your liver can process your kidneys can filter out and you can be free of hallelujah so with all those benefits uh why is it not a cure-all and be all to me well so when you're not eating, you are uh, depriving your body of having as much or as frequent poison going in with the food. That is true. But you're also depriving your body of having the nutrients go in, which is also true. Now, actually, before I get into any more of the science, let me just say the other reason why I think this is very compelling to people, other than the theory. I don't think the theory is enough that people would do this anywhere near as often as they do, Chrissy. I think the reason that people do it is because they feel good while they do it. And I think the reason people, uh, also the other reason they do it is because they feel bad when they don't do it in the sense that, um, you know, you get up, you don't eat, maybe drink a coffee, maybe you don't, but you're feeling good, you're flying high, you think you have energy, you think you have mental clarity, you do in a way. And then at some point you're like, oh, I gotta eat. And then you eat. And then you maybe feel tired, maybe feel more brain fog, maybe feel maybe other symptoms coming back and you're like, ugh. And so you start to get this association kind of conditioned into you that not eating good, eating bad. And of course this can get to extremes. I mean, look, can I relate to this? I had several years where pretty much every time I ate, I had a agonizing stabbing pain that painkillers would not resolve. So can I understand <laughs> that basic wiring of food equals bad, I must avoid. Of course I can. Um, and you know, even before that happened, I, I spent years and years basically intermittent. I, I spent over a decade intermittent fasting. It wasn't a thing to me. It was just eating two meals a day. That's what I did because my digestion was such that uh, if I ate a third meal, I would not feel good. And so, you know, it's as simple as that. So I do understand. Um, and I also used to spend several hours before I ate and all the rest of it. But it was making my problems worse, and I don't think I'm the only one. So let me explain. So first of all, you're, to go back to what I was saying before, you're depriving your body of nutrients that it needs in some cases, and in fact, in many cases, right? Whether it's like simple stuff like uh, carbohydrate, protein, potassium, sodium, these kind of basic things that is pretty much in all food. 
um, or whether it's specific stuff like magnesium or zinc or whatever it might be. If you are fasting, then at least for that period you're doing it, um, you are depriving your body of those things. And is that a problem if you're super topped up in those things and you have a little break? No, but a lot of people are not in that position. They're actually already deprived, certainly of the micronutrients um, and even the macronutrients. A lot of people are low in protein, you know, or specific amino acids. And so you're just making that problem worse. One of the seven root causes of chronic disease that I teach in my uh, forthcoming book is nutrient deficiency. Um, and deficiency in general, but usually specifically nutrients. And so you're going to make that worse when you take in less nutrition. I hope that's kind of obvious. Now, what about if you're having juices or something? You know, some people teach you, oh, we have vegetable juice, fruit juice, and that's giving you all the nutrients you need. It's giving you some nutrients. It's often not giving you many. Like, it's very good to not listen to anyone, including me, about what food is and isn't nutritious, and actually look at, like, food tables. Um, look at, you know, per 100 grams, look at it per portion and see... How much does it have of all these things? How, does it, how much does it have of each of the different vitamins? How much does it have of each of the different minerals? How much does it have of protein? And just see for yourself. And when you do that, you will see for yourself that in terms of all the things that are definitely nutrients, which are definitely essential to the body, which is things like vitamins, minerals, amino acids, not necessarily in terms of things that, you know, phytonutrients, like, yeah, sure, if you have a juice, it's got high levels of um you know like bioflavonoids maybe or or chlorophyll or quercetin or all kinds of like plant nutrients but those are not essential nutrients like those are things that you can live without that's not like magnesium and zinc and vitamin b1 that things that you can't live without and so when you look at what you're actually having during a juice fast you know you're probably gonna have high levels of folate and you know certain nutrients but there's gonna be a lot of nutrients that you're having a very low amount of and so that is a problem so that's a problem that with the lack of poison you also get the lack of nutrients okay but that's simple but let me go into more the experiential because i think that's more important when you wake up you don't feel hungry you have a coffee or something else something stimulating and then you don't or maybe juice even which is carbs and phytonutrients and not much else, um, then often you feel good for hours and hours and hours, and then maybe eventually you do feel tired or whatever or hungry, and then you eat something, and then you feel worse. Can you relate to that one, Chrissy? It's hard to think because it's been a long time since I've done some, some long-term ones in that. I've usually have felt pretty okay on fasting, except for certain times. Um, no, but, no, not feeling worse during fasting, feeling worse after you eat compared to before when you were not eating. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, like, I've, I've had things like that where it's like, oh, God, now I'm really tired. I need to go lay down. I'm That's just what like, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, that part. Sorry, excuse me for not um, <laughs> understanding that first part. Yeah. So extremely common. Even if someone like you, when, when we try and find health problems in you, we struggle, right? Like, <laughs> you're doing very well compared to most people, especially in our age range. Um, and yet you can still relate to that one. So it's very, very common. Um, and so, as I said, you start to get that programming, you know, not eating good, not eating bad, especially also, you know, as you said, a lot of people, majority of people want to lose weight. And so it kind of makes sense. If I'm not eating, I must be losing weight. That's the theory that makes sense to people. And of course, if you don't eat for a while, you will definitely lose some weight. That should um, be one of the myths. <laughs> we should have added that one in here so you can tag team it with that. Not <laughs> for sure. Not, not, uh, not eating. I'm definitely losing weight, which is definitely not the case. <laughs> well, let's talk about why it's not the case, right? Because most people do believe that. And of course, you know, if you were to not eat or barely eat for several years, would you become emaciated? Uh, like people, you know, you see in photos at certain points throughout history and all the rest of it. Uh, yes, although even they sometimes they get the swollen bellies and stuff, right? So it's, it's not really a desirable body shape to be genuinely starving, um, even if it does slim you down in some regards. Uh, but here's the thing. A lot of, there's kind of two directions you can go in if you want to lose weight. So let's move to that. Let's, let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. you just Good switch point. to that because that's like, so the next myth is something like, uh, yeah, the less you eat, the more you lose weight, right? Um, so when you, the, the main thing that controls um, how much energy your body is creating is called your metabolism, right? And so this is the mitochondrial energy producing factories. Uh, inside almost every cell except the red blood cells they create energy 
And so when you wake up in the morning and you don't eat for several hours, maybe you drink a coffee or something like that, maybe you don't, uh, where is your body getting energy? So your body makes energy from food uh, and oxygen. So from the air you breathe and the food you eat, very simply, right? Food you eat, kind of including calories in drinks as well. And so when you wake up and you don't eat and you feel energy, how is that possible? Because, you know, realistically, it should be the other way around, right? Why is it when you wake up and you don't eat, you have energy, and then later when you eat, you start to feel, as you said, tired, brain fog, you know, whatever it might, like feeling less energy, feeling less mental energy, feeling less physical energy. That shouldn't make sense, right? Because food is supposed to equal energy. We all learned that in high school and in science class. So why is our experience the, the exact opposite of that? It's because when your body runs out of energy uh, from food, it starts to dip into your reserve energy. And so um, in order to do that, in order to start liberating carbohydrates from storage, proteins from storage, and fats from storage, in order to do any of those processes and all those processes, it has to raise stress chemicals significantly to do that. And this is completely natural because throughout most of our history, and I say the most, the vast majority of our history as human beings, there was not enough food. Just like if we look at all animals in the wild right now, they are usually in a point of uh, food scarcity all the time, in the case of a carnivore, because they were a predator, because they always got to <laughs> catch something that wants to get away from them in order to eat. And even in the case of a herbivore, there's, you know, maybe there's plenty of grass around right now, but we never know how long that's going to be. Um, so there's always that potential food scarcity and there's always that desire to get as much food as possible. So the most, but the two most basic stresses that your body perceives as stresses to the body is uh, like a threat of a predator um, and then shortage of food. And so both of them will automatically get the stress response going for different reasons. In the case of the predator, it's to give more energy to the, the heart, the muscles, the lungs, certain areas of the brain for you to get away or to fight back. In the case of the lack of food, it's for you to get enough energy to, in the same methods really, to get some food. <laughs> That's what the body's like trying to get you to do. And so it doesn't understand that you're not eating on purpose. I guess that's the point it's getting to. It assumes if I'm not eating, it must be because there's not enough food and that is a crisis. And so first of all, it's a crisis um, and I've got to liberate some food from storage. And then second of all, it's a crisis and I've got to give enough energy for them to go and find some food. Now, the liberating food from storage, of course, is the whole point. If you listen to people who say it's a good way of losing weight, right? You're, you're um, instead of eating calories, you're getting calories that are stored in your body and that helps you lose weight. And of course that is true short term. But here's the thing, if you lack food and especially if you lack food pers persistently, your body has a mechanism to address that other than the one I just said. So raising stress chemicals is the immediate mechanism, but the long-term mechanism is to go, you know, it may be winter. It may, like there may not be some food available for a while for all kinds of reasons. And so what we need to do is we need to slow down the metabolism the metabolism being the rate at which your body creates energy, the speed at which it creates energy, and the speed at which it utilizes nutrients, again, uh, oxygen and food, in order to create energy. So it just slows that right down. And when it does that, there's less energy um, available for a lot of the, what are considered more luxury processes of the body. So digestion will slow down. Uh, the immune system capacity will slow down, the detoxification capacity will slow down, certain parts of brain function like creativity and memory and stuff like that will slow down and become less effective. Um, and so that's where you'll see people with depression, which is really like a, a lack of desire to do anything, um, like innate desire, which again is just a energy conservation strategy, you know, anxiety or worry and stuff like that. Um, which is more part of that, like, maybe I should still be trying to get food um, mode. There's um, uh, constipation, digestive issues, which are because the digestion is slowed down. Um, there is food allergies and intolerances, which is because the immune system has less 
capacity, there's chronic infections because the, because the immune system has less capacity, there's toxicity building up because the toxicity system, uh, processing system, liver, kidneys and all that, lymph system have less capacity. So all of these common, and also your body starts to conserve energy because it's in a hibernation mode and it's worried that there's not enough food around. So it actually starts to deposit more energy in the form usually of fat um, to make sure that you have enough of a buffer if the food becomes even lower. So a lot of the modern day problems that plague people, like being overweight, having anxiety, having depression, having digestive issues, having chronic infections, having allergies and intolerances, um, having skin issues as well. These are like the, the ubiqu having low energy, these are like the ubiquitous things that so many people complain of these days. And then they treat each of them as if they're separate. Oh, okay, I need to do this for energy. I need to fast for energy. I need to have coffee for energy. And I need to you know, fast or take Ozempic or whatever to lose weight. And then I need to you know, uh, do this to improve my mood. I need to have antidepressants for this. And I have, to have anti anxiety for this. And then I need to you know, take all these digestive things for this. But it's all part of the same thing. And so if you're one of those people who's fasting because you're suffering from a lot of those symptoms that I just said, you are actually making the situation worse medium to long term and sometimes even immediately because you are just slowing down the metabolism even more by eating less. Now, the other problem is some people just slow down and that's it. But some people, especially based on kind of, I would say, genetics and also maybe early life trauma, they kind of have this... Uh, again, this is an automatic bodily belief that um, I can't just slow down. Hibernation is not safe. So therefore, certain systems of my body are still going to slow down because there's just not enough energy and that's there's nothing I can do about that. But I need to actually speed up. I need to become energized to make sure that I am safe and to make sure that I do have the energy to get enough food. And so those are people who have more what we call adrenaline dominance. They become more highly adrenalized. And so uh, they will be the kind of person who especially like enjoys and responds well to the fasting, especially the intermittent fasting, especially the fasting in the morning, because when you have high levels of adrenaline, you are not hungry when you wake up and you are not hungry usually for several hours after you wake up either. So this is the classic thing, the very type of person often who is doing fasting, especially intermittent fasting, especially intermittent fasting in the morning, is the very person who should least be doing it because they are already running on adrenaline because their metabolism is already slow because they, you know, for whatever reason, could be genetic, could be nutrition, could be toxins, could be various different things. Often, but though it just starts because they were dieting or fasting or whatever because they wanted to lose weight. It could be as simple as that. Um, and then they become more and more adrenaline dominant. And then they take on belief systems like the fasting will cure everything, which supports that strategy. And... It just makes the situation uh, worse and worse and worse. And this is especially true for women. This does happen more to women. Um, first of all, maybe because women want to lose weight more. Um, and then I would say, uh, secondly, also, because women are more likely to have an issue with slow metabolism. You know, women are diagnosed with clinical hypothyroidism three times more often than men. It certainly still happens to men, but it happens more to women. Um, there's also something about the way women's hormonal system is, where it suffers more. One hundred percent. Yeah, I lack mean, of food. Exactly, and I think too. Um, just I've been listening to again going to the intermittent fasting. I'm listening to lots of Dr. Mindy Peltz talk about how our fluctuations in our hormones with the estrogen and the progesterone. Certain like estrogen is fine with fasting, progesterone not. And if we are continually in that space of fasting, 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 then there's that risk of that progesterone to estrogen balance getting way out of hand because that progesterone keeps the estrogen in check. And then we're in that space, like you saying, over adrenalized, too much estrogen, stress, 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 stress. And yeah, we're just in a, in a cycle that's very difficult to get out of. And that can lead to serious health problems. Uh, we won't talk about it here, but if you look up, you know, what are the long-term effects of excess estrogen in women, you can see they are uh, dangerous and life-threatening. So uh, this is, you know, this is why we're doing this myth busting episode because often, you know, the best of intentions, like I want to fast because I want to detox or I want to fast because I want to lose weight, can actually create much more serious health problems than if you'd have just 
carried on eating, you know, reasonably healthy food like the average person, unfortunately. It can actually make things significantly worse. For men too, I deal with plenty of men who have got themselves into a real uh, hole with this strategy where it's really messed them up, but it's definitely more common that it really is a problem for women for the reason you just explained, Chrissy. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry, you were going to say something else. Well, just to finish off, to go back to the point I wanted to remember to make. Oh, yes, I was going like to ask. Basically, yeah, because yeah, there are certain times where um, there's certain criteria where it is absolutely beneficial because I know I like to do it, but I'm, I'm becoming more aware of there are times where it's not appropriate or it might not be in my best interest. Yeah. So here's what I would say. As I said, usually people do it in response to trying to resolve the symptoms that are fundamentally caused or at least contributed to by low metabolism. So if you have if your problems are caused by low metabolism, then doing something that slows your metabolism more, as much as it may make you feel better temporarily or even lose weight temporarily, because of course if you really starve your body of nutrients, it will cannibalize some of your body's tissues in order to have enough energy to function. Um, but as I said, it's eventually you won't be able to stick to it. This is why 95% of diets fail. Um, it's not because everyone's weak-willed it's because eventually you're you're you, like the unconscious part of you takes over and goes i really want carbs or i really want fat or even sometimes i really want protein and it's you're just going to find yourself eating cookies or pizza or whatever it might be and it's not because you're so weak-willed or whatever it is because your body took over and said enough of this nonsense you know there's plenty of food around why are you pretending there isn't and makes you start eating it's as simple as that but then the problem is your metabolism slowed even more so, and your body is going to store even more as fat and this is why not only do 95 percent of diets not work they actually often make the person worse they make them gain more weight um so if your problems are fundamentally caused by low metabolism fasting will make it worse but there are some benefits to fasting. So under what conditions is fasting a good idea? And what under what conditions is fasting a healthy thing to do? I would say under the conditions of already having optimized the metabolism first. So if you're, you know, within a few hours of waking up, throughout the middle of the day, your temperature is a stable and consistent 37 or 98.6 then by all means you can try fasting i still don't think morning fasting makes sense unless you are genuinely resting but certainly skipping the last meal of the day so you just have breakfast and lunch can make a lot of sense um you know it may help you lose weight it will definitely help your body detoxify and, and do those kind of recy cell recycling processes and all the rest of it but here's the thing you want to monitor your metabolism which you do by monitoring your core temperature carefully now if, and let's say you want to fast for a whole day or a weekend or even three days, five days a week, whatever. To say you need to make sure your metabolism doesn't go down is unrealistic because while you are doing it, it will. It, it, it almost certainly will. If your body's really good at really jacking up your stress chemicals, it might look like it's not because the stress chemicals can also raise the temperature. And usually the way you can tell if that's what's going on is to see if the temperature drops a little bit after eating. But if you're not eating, then you can't tell. Um... But if you fast for whatever period of time, then you go back to eating, then you check your core temperature. If your core temperature is right back to where it was, then that's great. You are metabolically healthy. Your metabolism is healthy. You're metabolically flexible. Your body is able to slow down when you eat less. It's able to go right back to speeding up to being an optimal level when you go back to eating again. And it's all good. And for that kind of person, I would say fasting is beneficial. I still don't think it will resolve all health issues because some health issues are caused by a lack of nutrients, which fasting is not going to resolve. Um, and it's you know it's, some of it is caused by uh, you know uh, an imbalance of hormones. Say as you just mentioned, not enough progesterone, too much cortisol, things like that. Which again, fasting is not going to resolve, but it can still you know be really beneficial. But that would be the criteria. Only do it. If first of all, your metabolism is already optimized and second of all, you check and your metabolism goes right back to being optimal as soon as you have discontinued fasting. Great point. So everybody get your thermometers as we discussed in our Wilson's episode on really looking at the thyroid and the temperature and how to gauge it. And yeah, this are really good points, Ellen, because the thing that uh, we've, um, since we've been talking about this is really that understanding of which I know for me, because I've done it in the past, of thinking I was doing the right thing. And it wasn't until later actually realizing, oh, I've set myself back. I've actually caused, I've put myself in the other direction of where I wanted to go. Yep.
Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. So our next myth coming in is from Elon Musk saying anything over 1000 parts per million CO2 is really uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I've praised him a few times. You know, I am a fan of, uh, you know, his projects, the, uh, I think creating reusable space rockets is really good. I'm, I'm a big dis, uh, disliker of inefficiency and I think spending a fortune on a rocket that can only be used once is <laughs> kind of a real waste of time and resource and all the rest of it. So I'm a big fan of all that kind of stuff and I have a Tesla battery in my garage and all the rest of it. However, it doesn't mean that I think he's right about everything. And so I thought, let's pick on him for a moment because I've quote, quoted him a couple of times of you know saying things that I think are accurate. So let's pick a thing that I think is inaccurate. So um, the idea that uh, and I think that that was the exact quote that I heard him say. I don't want to, you know, misquote him, but you know, he generally gave the idea that um, the level that the CO two is going up is probably not an emergency right now, but eventually it'll get to a point where it really is a problem. Now that may well be true, but the specific number that he picked, I would definitely dispute. So there is a lot of research that shows that actually the more CO2 that there is in the environment, not only do more plants grow, but actually also the more healthy the organism is. And it's specifically actually the ratio of oxygen to CO2. One of the best longevity tips that exists out there, which I think probably, I don't know if we talked about, uh, we talked about how, for instance, being shorter is one of the best things you can do for uh, living a long time, but that's not something that you know we can control. But uh, you know, another one is actually the altitude that you live at. So people who live at a high altitude absolutely live longer and have better health outcomes than people who don't. And do you think that's directly related to the CO2? And well, less I oxygen? think it's, it's directly related to the ratio of CO2 to oxygen. So there isn't more CO2 at higher altitude, but what there is is less oxygen. So oxygen is, as much as it is you know, key for life and energy, um, it is also an oxidant. You may have heard that term. Um, you know, rusting is what happens when oxygen interacts with uh, iron, obviously. And you know, there are some experts who have this theory that the uh, rusting, literally, like the um, that free iron in our system is one of the primary causes of ill health and aging and all the rest of it. That it is a real problem because of it becoming oxidized. So the you know it is undoubtedly the case that an excess of oxygen um, is especially you know, um, free oxygen particles is going to create a problem in terms of you know it's called free radicals and it has this uh, you know damaging effect on everything around it. Now it's not quite as simple though as you know excess oxygen bad uh, because it is case by case. So your body will actually use oxygen to kill off different organisms inside you. Um, and so you know, high, a lot of your immune system constituents actually create hydrogen peroxide, uh, which then reacts to different things. The oxygen like leaves and it becomes H2O, like water. So it will, um, you know, that free oxygen atom will go off and it does that to kill organisms. So there are some benefits even to those free oxygen atoms, but overall an excess of them um, is damaging to the system. It will oxidize the fats inside you, for instance. These are called lipid uh, peroxides. And this is something that you know, is a marker of uh, you know, aging and ill health over time. So I won't explain the whole theory again, because I said to keep these succinct, but I recommend that you watch the episode that we did on uh, CO2, uh, if you can link to that in the description, Chrissy. But just in a nutshell, uh, CO2 is a nutrient, is an essential nutrient that you would die without. And the most important function that it does is it transports oxygen from your red blood cells, so from your blood, to every cell, specifically to the mitochondria inside every cell that actually produces your energy. So if you don't have enough CO2, you will die. And if you have a suboptimal amount of CO2, then there is not enough oxygen being transported to the mitochondria, which is one of the fundamental reasons that causes metabolic um, dysfunction, the stuff that we've talked about earlier. Other problems you know, that cause metabolic dysfunction are lack of nutrients, lack of thyroid, um, 
And you know, when it comes to nutrients, iron is a key one, right? That's called anemia, but it could be other things, B12 or copper, magnesium, whatever. Um, but when not enough oxygen can get into the mitochondria, then your body is creating energy in a more inefficient way. And long term, this can have serious and indeed life threatening consequences. So having enough CO2, especially CO2 in ratio to oxygen is uh, crucial for health. It's crucial for mitochondrial energy production. It's crucial for optimal mitochondrial energy production, which means that every system in your body has an abundance of energy. And so the problem is there are certain things that make us more um, resistant to CO2. Like we start to not be able to handle enough CO2 and stress makes us resistant to CO2 um, and um, exertion makes us resistant to CO2. Really, that's just because the exertion creates more CO2 in us. So, but it, let's put it this way, the more exertion, the more you exert yourself, the more you're going to feel like the CO2 in the environment is excessive. So we put it that way. And then... Um, uh, eating, especially overeating, especially protein as well, will make you less resistant to CO2. Um, the crucial one I've said there, though, I think really is the first one, because uh, you need to eat and you need to uh, exercise. But the key thing to realize is if you're stressed all the time, you're going to have a reduced capacity to handle CO2. And it's a vicious circle because CO2 is one of, if not, depending on who you listen to, the primary calming nutrient in the whole body. It's absolutely a uh, vasodilator. Um, I, I agree, I think this is Ray Pete's assessment, I agree that it is the primary calming because if you have enough CO2, then your mitochondria has enough oxygen. If your mitochondria has enough oxygen, as long as you have other less crucial things in place, then like eating, like we just talked about, uh, <laughs> having enough food, then your body will create enough energy. When your body has enough energy, it doesn't need to be in a stress state. So, you know, to me, like CO2 is a, and just on an experiential level as well, this is why doing the kind of yoga breathing techniques where you hold your breath for a long period of time and stuff like that is like profoundly relaxing. When you first do it, you might be like, oh, panicking, oh, I'm running out of breath, stuff like that. But if you stick with it and you keep doing it, you often find yourself feeling extremely relaxed, extremely peaceful. And that's partly because it's dilated the blood vessels, but it's mainly because it's created this you know, uh, it shifted the balance of metabolism and, and mitochondrial energy production in your body. And it's just like, it just really relaxes you. It really brings your stress levels down. Um, so yeah, that's all the kind of pranayama stuff. It, uh, and even the Wim Hof method, I guess, is a version of that because it always ends with that long breath hold with, even though you do the quick breathing and then always you do holding your breath for as long as possible. And so, yeah, it, it has that kind of really relaxing effect. Wim Hof also, the other half of Wim Hof is to hyperventilate, which spikes the stress chemicals, so he's got a bit of both, but, uh, you know, some of the other breathing practices do. Anyway, the point is, it's extremely relaxing. So, if a high level of CO2 in your environment is uncomfortable, I do not see that as a sign that it's unhealthy. That's the crucial thing that I wanted to take issue with. I see that as a sign that the person is metabolically unhealthy and stressed, because I can tell you from my experience, Yes, it's true. I think it's 400, 300, 400, which is normal in an ambient environment. Um, when I have 1,000 in my environment, I do not have an issue at all unless I'm stressed <laughs> or I'm trying to exert myself. Um, and, you know, then it does become more uncomfortable. But, you know, I will purposely raise the CO2 in my environment to like several thousand uh, parts per million and it makes me more relaxed. Uh, to begin with, if it's if if I go from say four hundred to four thousand, to begin with, my body's like, oh, what's this? Like it has that kind of initial reaction to it, like this intolerance. Um, but then, if you're like, it's okay, you know, stick with it, breathe normally, it's not a problem. And then the body adapts to it, and it's like, oh my god, I feel really, really like uh, relaxed and peaceful now. So I do not think it's innately a problem to have more CO two in the environment. And you might be like, well, what about exercise, Elwin? Um, it would make doing the same amount more difficult if the amount of CO2 in the environment just suddenly doubled, for instance. But it would actually make the impact of the exercise you do do uh, more beneficial. So you would actually, so you may not be able to run as quickly or for as long or whatever, especially to begin with while you're adapting to the CO2. But you would get just as much benefit um, because you know a lot of the benefit from exercising is actually that it increases the level of CO2 in the body. 
Yeah, great point, great point. And another question just popped up because you were discussing Wim Hof and we, in our um, uh, episode on the CO2, we were really discussing Buteyko. Do, or would you say either one of those was better at increasing your tolerance to CO2 or would you say that they have the same? Buteyko breathing is all about increasing your tolerance to CO2. So if that's what you want to do, if you want to take, you don't have to believe me, but if you want to take that theory and run with it and test it for yourself, then uh, Buteyko breathing method would be the way of uh, increasing your tolerance to CO2 most quickly and most effectively and to see it for yourself. And then just one more point on this, uh, where you were talking about raising the CO2 in your environment. Were you referring back to, because as we discussed previously in another episode, about the CO2 bath? Is yeah. that the environment? Yeah. That's okay. the simplest way to do it. And I have a CO2 meter, so I can actually see um, how much it goes up. Uh, it's not the only way you can get uh, the uh, CO2 tank and, and like release a little bit into the environment. Some people do CO2 baths where they, um, not, not a water bath, but like getting into a plastic thing, which, you know, um, uh, the CO2 gas is pumped in there. So much higher CO2 levels are, your body's immersed in them, but you're not breathing that extremely high level in because it would be too much for, you, for your body to handle. So there's kind of like different CO2 systems and treatments out there. But yeah, the bath bomb with uh, alkaline acid, like some sodium bicarbonate and some um, citric acid or vinegar or something is the simplest way to massively increase the CO2 in your environment. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. Our next myth that we are going to discuss is medications cure things. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I saw, I think it was Dr. Smith. Uh, I don't want to give him credit if it wasn't him, but I think, you know, he said he, he, he asked a chat GPT or something like that. Um, tell me what medicines have been uh, discovered or created in the last 100 years that do not um, treat infections, which actually cure diseases. And like it wasn't able to come up with anything. Um, so I think one of the things that gave mainstream medicine such credibility, because at the time it first started to become prominent, you know, there were lots of other competing systems. Homeopathy was really popular at the time, for instance, uh, was the invention or discovery of antibiotics. Like that was a big deal. A lot of people used to just die of bacterial infection. And this thing came along and just take this thing and usually the side effects are pretty minimal compared to the effects of the actual infection and you don't have the infection anymore. That was a miracle, right? A lot of people did used to just die of infection. That's really the last truly impressive thing that modern medicine did, unfortunately, in any kind of wide scale. Now, it's very impressive what they can do in some elements of emergency care, very impressive what they can do in certain very niche situations with certain very serious diseases. But in terms of things that really have a widespread impact and in terms of like massive shifts, that I'd say the invention of antibiotics is still like the biggest one. But other than that, most things that people suffer with these days, they are never cured, they're only treated. And they're treated at a significant cost. So let's go back to the um, example I gave earlier. I said if your metabolism is slow, it could affect you in a million different ways because Slow metabolism means lack of cellular energy. Lack of cellular energy can impact any system of your body negatively. But the really common things are weight gain, skin issues, immune issues, whether it's allergies and intolerances, or chronic infections, often both, um, brain issues, brain fog, anxiety, depression, lack of energy, feeling cold, though not everyone is aware of this, 
um, digestive issues, and I'd say respiratory issues. I didn't say it last time, but that's another one. Um, these are like really, really common signs of a low metabolism. And oh, and um, I said weight gain, but I'd say uh, edema, so holding on to a lot of water. And that's kind of like the more severe sign of uh, low metabolism and low thyroid function that happens over time. People get really severe edema. And so like 100 years ago, that was probably still not cured, but treated in a more effective way. Um, they would generally, if you had a lot of those symptoms and high cholesterol was like a blood marker for it, they would just give you some thyroid glandular, uh, which is more in the way of a food and medication, although they decided to designate it as a medication. Now it's only available by prescription, but up until then it was just, you could just go and get it from your butcher as a food. Um, and that like, so it depends. Does that, is it a cure if you have to keep taking something? That's a bit of an interesting philosophical point, right? Because you could say, well, you know, I'm not, um, I feel ill unless I eat like uh, protein, but it's like, but you need protein, you know? So is it a food or is it medicine? As I say, when they reclassify as a medicine, it's a bit different, but when it was just another facet of meat, you could maybe look at it more as food and you can say it kind of is a cure. Anyway, I won't argue one side or the other on that, but the point is one simple food stroke medicine resolved all those different issues. What do you have these, what do you do these days, right? If you have those same issues, let's go through the list. If you have depression, they might put you in antidepressants. If you have anxiety, they might put you in anti-anxieties. If you have low energy, usually doctors don't treat that, but they, you still result of drugs, but you'll result of caffeine usually, right? Coffee or whatever. If you have weight gain, uh, you know, a few decades ago, they were treated with stimulants, amphetamines they would give out, for instance, freely in the 60s to all kinds of people. These days, it's so Zempic. Um, if you have allergies, they will give you antihistamines. If you have recurring infections, they will give you antibiotics, which do work for the infection, but if the infection comes back again in a few weeks or months, has it really worked? You know, but anyway... Um, if you feel cold all the time, they just tell you to wear more clothes. <laughs> they don't really treat that one. Um, <laughs> uh, if you have skin issues, they will give you uh, maybe antifungal, but cortisol, you know, cortisone cream more commonly. Um, if you have uh, digestive issues, they might give you an antiacid, or maybe they'll give you an antibiotic, depending on which part of the digestive system is affected. Um, or if it's IBS, they give you an antispasmodic. Now, First of all, notice the word that I keep using there, like the commonality, it's the anti, right? They keep going against the process that's happening. But of all the things I do, just listed, do any of them actually cure or resolve the problems that I've just said? No. Oh, and by, I'm sorry. And if you have high cholesterol, they give you an anti-cholesterol, which you know, is usually a statin, which causes way more problems than it solves um, <laughs> because it turns out your body actually needs cholesterol it's the central part of every cell of your body. It's the central part of, uh, you know, your body to, to make all the hormones that make you feel good. Oh, I missed this out from the list. But, you know, very common as well with low thyroid is uh, sex hormone uh, imbalances. So in men, it's low testosterone. In women, it's low progesterone. Um, so, you know, that's another one. And what do they do about that? In the past, nothing. These days, they maybe they'll give you testosterone or progesterone. Uh, often in the case of women, they don't give them progesterone, they give them birth control pills or, you know, something completely stupid like that, which is definitely not resolving that problem, at least. It might be resolving the unwanted pregnancy problem, but it's not resolving the progesterone deficiency. Um, so, and then the other thing, and I think this is the point you're really getting to. So first of all, it's not resolving anything. And then second of all, they all create all kinds of side effects. We've took, and I won't go through all of them because I promised I was going to keep this short, but any of these antis that I just listed or statins, just look up that word and side effects and then look up that word and uh, side effects commonality and maybe, you know, start talking to people and stuff like that. And you'll see that side effects, like they have to list them on the packaging because they can't be sued if they do. So there's, that's why there's usually such a big list of things. Um, but, what, you know... Often they'll say it's like one in a hundred, one in a thousand, and it may be for a lot of those things that they're listed. But the point is that 
very few of these medicines don't create more problems than they resolve. That's the issue. Now, I'm not saying that um, I'm against any of them. And if a doctor says it's a good idea for you, then it's a good idea. But what I am suggesting that you question is if it doesn't resolve anything and it creates side effects and you keep taking it not just for a week, like in the case of maybe a round of antibiotics, but month after month, year after year, decade after decade, because it isn't resolving anything, um, could it eventually cause more problems than it resolves? And, you know, you said, Chrissy, before we, we started, and it's a really good point, a lot of the time you get people coming to you with problems and what they don't realize is that the problems are actually caused by the very things that they're taking. Exactly. And, and caused not in some esoteric, you know, I feel it with my uh, intuition or something, but like just look at the label and see what it says and you'll see that your problem is listed right there. And sure enough, if you stop taking it after whatever it is, few weeks, few months, make sure you do it correctly. Obviously, stopping taking a lot of the things that I just listed in a haphazard way is genuinely dangerous. So don't just do it. But if you work with a doctor who understands this kind of stuff and supports you in getting off them, what you'll find a lot of the time is uh, that these things will resolve themselves because they were never really a problem. They were a side effect of trying to treat the original problem. And again, treat the original problem, not resolve the original problem. Because as I say, a lot of the time, the resolution... Now, it depends. Let's go back to the, you know, the uh, metabolism thing for a second. Slow metabolism could be caused by not eating enough and not eating frequently enough. We've just talked about that. It could be caused by missing some nutrient like iron or B12, for instance. In that case, it's pretty easy to resolve. It could be caused by low thyroid function. That's very common and underdiagnosed. If it's low thyroid function, what causes that? Well, it could be stress. It could be not eating. Just talked about that. Uh, but it could also be genetic. And if you have a genetic tendency for low thyroid, then you can either decide you're just going to live with it or you can decide, uh, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to give my body some of the thing that it's not making itself. But I would say, um, even though you could say it's not really a cure, it's at least treating the root cause, which is what I encourage people to do rather than only treating the symptom. So to me, root causes are, and again, I'll give the list, this is from the Rejuvenate Blueprint, forthcoming book, and we've already done videos on it if people can't wait. Um, it's going to be a nutrition, it's going to be a deficiency of something, usually a nutrient, but you know, things like CO2 could be in that category. It's going to be an excess of something, which is a toxin. Um, it's going to be an imbalance of something, you know, usually hormones and neurotransmitters are what I'm focused on. Maybe it's some lifestyle factor. Maybe you think it's heroic to only sleep four hours a night. That's going to create a problem. Uh, it's going to be some kind of chronic infection, or it's going to be some kind of attitude or emotional belief, trauma, something like that, something, you know, emotionally, mentally caused. Like, you know, if you have a belief that I will never be healthy or whatever, then it's very hard to get healthy no matter what physical, practical things that you do. So those would be more what, you know, maybe the word cure still isn't right, but, you know, addressing and resolving root causes, that's how I look at it. But if you're, if the thing that you're doing is only treating a symptom, if it's not even attempting to address the root cause, then it's probably not the best strategy because it's much more likely to create side effects. Uh, and that includes if you're you know, treating lab tests, like high cholesterol uh, is correlated, maybe, especially, well, let's say very high cholesterol, especially LDL cholesterol, is correlated with more uh, cardiovascular disease. But is it causing it? That's definitely something that's a lot more open to debate and a lot of people would say no. And in fact, having cholesterol near the top of the reference range is actually shown to be protective and beneficial compared to having it low in the reference range. So, uh, yeah, rather than treating symptoms with antis, I would say look at the root causes. Fantastic. Because a lot of times, you know, I am speaking to individuals and I'm going, I'm trying to figure out, okay, what's going on? Because everything looks pretty good. And I'm like, oh, what medications are you taking? And because sometimes they won't even think about it. They won't even think that that is a potential um, cause or, you know, a consequence to where they're at or what's going on. And so that really brings in that awareness of going, oh yes, okay, I'm taking this, but there are certain risks evolved and associated or could be potentially associated with that. 
Yeah, and I would say, I mean, I don't see that as much with people I deal with, but honestly, it's the same with um, herbs and supplements, you know? Uh, it can create problems. If it's not the thing that you actually need, it can potentially make things worse. So it's always good to... Con when it comes to toxins, it's not only the obvious stuff. It's not only, you know, heavy metals or uh, whatever. It's actually look at everything that you're doing and it, it may be a toxin to you, you know? That's the crucial thing, including medications, including supplements, including herbs, including foods, like including everything, including the air you're breathing, whatever. <laughs> uh, anything could be a toxin to you and definitely close to the top of the list would be any medications you're on for, you know, potential suspects. Yeah, and you made a good point. And sometimes they are inevitable because there are things that we do need to take. And yet, if it is something that's come up and there isn't a... Um, you know, that root cause identified, associated, or an understanding, like if there's a genetic aspect and something needs to um, be supplemented with or taken indefinitely, different story. But if it's that thing that just come up and then you're speaking with your doctor or whomever, and they say, yeah, you're on it indefinitely. It's like, well, okay, let me investigate this a little bit further. Because as you rightly said, there's a lot of anti stuff just kind of not even, well, yes, treating the symptoms, but trying to give you relief from the symptom, but not ultimately um, having you come out the other side of this. I think the key thing is that phrase root cause. No one's saying to not listen to your doctor. What I would say is ask your doctor, is this addressing the root cause of what's going on? And if they look at you blankly or say no, then I'm not saying don't listen to your doctor, I'm saying find a new doctor to whom that is not a ridiculous question, who actually understands that. Like some of the doctors we featured here, like Dr. Uh, Mikitsky, who you know features regularly, that's exactly the question that she's asking. It's not like a doctor is incapable of asking that question, it's just that a lot of them don't. So find a doctor who does. Fantastic and excellent, Ellen. This has been lots of fun today, and I've really enjoyed it. I know we've got quite a, you know a few more to get to, so we'll definitely want to be doing a part two to this at some point. Um, before we close, are there any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, thank you for watching. If you would like to see a part two, let us know. If you if there's a myth that you would like to me to address, then please put it under uh, in the comments. And um, hopefully, by the time this comes out, my plan is that uh, the book, The Rejuvenate Blueprint the uh, addressing the addressing and resolving the seven root causes of chronic disease uh, working title we'll see what it actually is when it's uh, up there uh, should be available at least for pre-sale possibly actually for sale uh, on Amazon um, and then you know go to my website as well to like get a bonus to it so uh, look out for that and of course we did talk a bit about genetics so if you're interested in that go to geneticinsights.co and uh, learn about what we can do for you in that regard. Fantastic as always. And again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. It's, you know, our pleasure to be here. And remember, your health is in your hands. You are the best advocate for yourself. And we hope that you're enjoying your time with us and that you find this valuable. And if so, please let us know. Subscribe, hit that like button, and we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here, if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below, if you want to click on that one and watch that next.